Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is almost the witching hour. It is the 15th of April, tax day 2019. We have a meeting of the State and City Council, and the venerable Timex says it's 7 o'clock, so let's go to work. Please join me in a flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Ah. Ah, thank you all and welcome. Uh, Let's see, the whole council is here, staff is here, um, public works director is off at a, what a meeting, training? Training conference in Not here, okay. Uh, let's see, are there any additions to the agenda? I don't hear any. Declarations of ex-party contract, contact, conflicts of interest, bias, Anything? Mr. Mayor. Yes. When it comes time for the uh, public hearing on the zone map amendment for 1160 East Jefferson, I'm going to abstain. Um, I think, uh, just so everyone knows, uh, Mr. Humphrey is a good family friend of ours, and I just uh, don't want to give any kind of false premise, so I'm going to abstain from voting. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I'd also like to Council. declare I've been to that residence several times just passing it uh, I've looked over it once or twice noticed the sign it shouldn't influence my vote tonight okay Anyone mr. Else? mayor yes um, I would like to disclose that I have been down uh, that street and I passed that residence and possibly even knocked on their door um, during campaigning so but it won't influence my vote okay okay I have not even looked down that street. <laughs> do, you know, do, you know where, do you know where that street is? I present to the audience, clean as the driven snow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, folks. No, that's no, it's good. This is all. This is what we need to do, uh, so that uh, we're above most uh, most criticism. Not all, but most. Okay. Um, Let's see. Presentations, comments from the public. John Mesa. Uh, we're going to have Deanna, Humf uh, Deanna Ferris uh, in a minute, but this is the one, the one green slip tonight. So, John, come and share with us. Oh, here comes another one. That's fine. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm uh, John Mesa with Moxie Berry, uh, North Third Avenue, uh, also a resident of Staten. Uh, what I'm responding to is one, the positive comment for the new ordinances changing with the food trucks for the streets. So I'm for uh, the change. However, uh, I think we should take more time to deliberate on the change for North Third Avenue um, with the restrictions of North Third and maybe come up with a better plan for Third Avenue. Um, and that's why I have on my box, I'm for and oppose. Uh, I am opposed for daytime food trucks um, on North Third, um, but I am for evening activities for the businesses that are coming into North Third to have them have the ability to be able to utilize our food trucks for okay. special events and things for them. Okay. So I'd like us to see, uh, or I'd like to see some more planning going into uh, North Third Avenue, knowing all that goes into that, uh, the okay. complexity of it all. So all right. that's my comment on that. Okay, thank you, John. All right, thank you. Or could, yeah, thank, thank you. you, John. Uh, Mr. Fleischman, uh, is that a, a new, he raising a new, a new concern, a new question? Uh, Mr. Mason and I have had conversation. I believe that he may have also had a conversation with the police chief. So okay. it's not new to me, but it is new to council because council has not yet discussed this item. Okay. Is that something that's coming to us? Uh, it, it is on your agenda for later this evening. Later this evening. Well, hell, that's coming to us, isn't it? Okay. Thank you. Amending licensing standards for mobile food units. There it is. Okay. Chris Klein. Uh, 
Hello, I'm horrible at this, but <clears throat> my name is Chris Klein, part of Snow Peak Brewing Company. I, uh, my residence is in Almsville, sublimity pretty much, but uh, I'm here for the food truck thing also. I didn't know what to write because, yeah, I didn't know, I just found out about this this morning, so I was like trying to scramble to get off work. Um, we are trying to do the same thing with the amending of the code, I guess it would be called. Uh, trying to get food trucks to be able to park in front of Snow Peak um, with their window on the um, sidewalk side, not blocking any traffic or any um, pedestrian uh, right of way um, for the reasons of safety for our patrons to have to walk across the street to the parking lot, wherever we would have to get them to park. Um, it's a safety aspect for the people. It's a safety aspect for um, people that are coming <clears throat> so they can grab something to eat and a beer and not, you know, we all know food and beer is a lot better than just a beer. So uh, trying to <laughs> trying to encourage um, uh, responsibility where that would help with having a food truck available for people to get some kind of a snack or a meal or uh, also for kids, you know, because we're going to be open to families. Um, so, yeah, that's <laughs> uh, that's what I'm here. Thank you. All right, thank you, thank you, Chris. All right, uh, anything else? No more green slips. Um, uh, State and Public Library Foundation, Ms. Ferris, would you like to make do a presentation this evening? It's hard to follow food trucks when you're the library, but. Uh, <laughs> No, it's uh, my pleasure on behalf of the State and Public Library Foundation to present our annual um, gift to the city in support of the State and Public Library. This year we're presenting a check and um, I've discussed this with uh, Mr. Campbell and uh, we're presenting a check for $6,500 um, to be used at the city's discretion and support of the library operations. We also uh, have agreed uh, for the upcoming fiscal year, so 2019-20, to please uh, be invited to include us in your budget. Uh, we'd like to present the same um, gift this time next year as well. Uh, we'll certainly set our goals for that. And we are committed to, again, support the Outreach Storyteller Program fully funded at, uh, I think it's $24,000, so we will continue to support that program. And we're just really, really grateful for the partnership that uh, we have with Jana in particular. I'd like to point that out with Jana and her team. Make our job fun and easy. Um, I feel like we're there to serve our city employees, but it always feels like the other way around. So you've got a great team at the library, and we really appreciate that. And in uh, closing, the ways that we are able to raise this money for the library are kind of threefold. But uh, so we have some events. We have uh, donors in the community that commit um, to give to us annually. And uh, we also seek some grant funding from foundations. Our fundraising efforts in the last two years have uh, centered around some events, um, one of which we had in January, which was the Bruise Bites and Books. Several of you were there, and I thank you for that. And uh, one of our most popular ones is the Father-Daughter Ball, which is coming up in May. So we have lots of support from the community, from businesses that sponsor that event. We expect over 300 fathers and daughters from the community to come. It's a partnership with the high school to let us use the facility. Uh, we just love uh, your support um, for helping us sell tickets, get the word out to thank and support our community partners that uh, come back year after year, summit cleaning. I could probably stumble um, and forget someone without uh, having my script, but summit cleaning is our premier sponsor for our slumber company, um, Sigmund Excavation, Allied Rock, uh, SCTC, mm, yeah, Moxie Berry is coming in this year. We're also really proud to announce that we're partnering with the uh, Staten Teen Center. Sanium Teen Center? Yes. So we're sharing uh, the responsibility for the event and uh, some of the fundraising efforts in order to really broaden our scope and just further step out as a community-wide event for the father, Sanium Canyon Father Daughter. 
comfortable. So if you uh, see us on Facebook, like us. If you have uh, daughters, granddaughters, nieces, um, anyone that you think would be interested in going, please uh, help us spread the word. It's for ages, I think we say five to 18. I try to go every year, but I'm too old. So I just get to, uh, <laughs> I just get to help plan, but we're really grateful for your support and um, thanks for all the service that you guys do and all the hours you put in as city council and um, city employees. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dion. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, uh, that's it for that. Uh, let's look at the consent agenda this evening, folks. Let's see what we want to do with that. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I make a motion that we accept the consent agenda as presented. Okay. A motion second. to accept and a second. Thank you. Um, you know, this, and the purpose of the consent agenda, it says that um, the recorder will poll council members individually. And I always just ask for a yes or no. Um, Melissa, would you like to poll the council on consent agenda? <laughs> sure, I'd be happy to. <laughs> and the motion is to approve it as presented. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, <laughs> since that's what's written. Okay. Councilor Mullen? Yes. Councilor Ort? Yes. Councilor Hook? Yes. Councilor Quigley? Yes. Councilor Patty? Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Okay, thank you. And we go right now to a public hearing on a zone map amendment 1160 East Jefferson Street. And I have to read a, a thing, Many, most of you heard this probably maybe lots of times. Uh, let's see, good evening, my name is Hank Porter and Mayor of Staten, I'll be presiding over this hearing. This is the time and place set for a public hearing in the matter of land use file number 2-02-19, an application to change the zoning designation from low density residential to medium density residential at 1160 East Jefferson Street. The hearing is now open. Oregon land use law requires a statement be made to those in attendance that covers certain matters relative to this case. That statement with all the information required to be presented under the Oregon Arise Statutes 197.763 bracket 5 is printed and available at the back counter. If you have not yet received one of these forms, you should go get one and review it prior to presenting your testimony. If anyone has any questions regarding anything on the statement or objects to it not being read out loud, please raise those questions when it comes your turn to speak during the hearing. Also at the back counter is the agenda for this evening's meeting, which lays out the order in which people will be called on to speak during the public hearing the Planning Commission's Rules of Procedure for Land Use Public Hearings, and a brochure written to facilitate your participation in the public hearing. You're encouraged to obtain and read a copy of these documents as well. At this time, I would ask the audience if there are any objections to the notice that was sent in this case. I hear none. To the jurisdiction of this body to hear and consider this case. I hear none. If there are any declarations of conflict of interest, ex parte contact, or oh, are there any by members of this body? And those have already been declared, so we are ready they, for They the should be declared as part of the record for this hearing. Okay. Since you've All now right. banged the gavel to open the hearing. Are there any declarations of conflict of interest, ex parte contact, or bias by any members of this body? Mr. Mayor. Yes. Once again, uh, I will abstain from voting on this uh, hearing due to the fact that I consider uh, Mr. Humphrey's close personal friends of the family. Okay. Mr. I will Mayor. again declare my ex parte contact, or not contact, but uh, site visits uh, where I have looked okay. at the residents. And also, apparently, we were also campaigning in that area. I don't remember going to that house, but okay. it's the same. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, um, yes. I'd like to declare that I have uh, definitely been by the house and I believe I campaigned um, at that house as well, okay. looking at right. the Thank property you. where it is. Anyone else? Okay. We are now ready for the staff introduction. Mr. 
Dan. <laughs> Thank you. Dan. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, members of the audience. Uh, the issue before you this evening is a public hearing on an application to amend the city's official zoning map uh, for the property at 1160 East Jefferson. Uh, the application requests you change the zoning from low density residential to medium density residential. Uh, the Planning Commission held a hearing on this uh, at their, when was that, their March meeting uh, and forwarded it to you with a recommendation. Um, after we hear the applicant's presentation, I'll have a little bit more detail in my staff report. Okay, thank you, Dan. All right, so uh, applicant presentation. Mr. Humphreys. <coughs> Council, Tad Humphreys. Uh, I own the property at 1160 East Jefferson Street. Uh, I haven't owned it for a long period of time, uh, but the property was built uh, as a duplex in 1949, and I just thought that I wanted it to be zoned correct for what it's being used for versus having it a non-conforming use. So that's kind of all I have for a presentation. I don't have a slideshow for you or anything like that. So any questions? Uh, um, it's got a duplex on it now. Is there room for another one? Uh, You'd have to talk to Dan about that. <laughs> okay. I don't know that that's necessarily a concern, just a, just a question, but that's fine. That's, that's all I've got. Anyone else? Questions at this point? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ted. Um, staff report. So, uh, as I said in the introduction, the property is currently zoned low density residential. It is a 15,000 square foot lot with a duplex that was built well before the city of Staten had zoning and it has been a legally existing non-conforming use since we adopted the zoning code sometime in the 1970s. Um, to uh, answer the mayor's question to the applicant, uh, the lot is large enough under medium density zoning that should the duplex be removed, the lot could be partitioned into two 7,500 square foot lots or a 7,000 and an 8,000 square foot lot and each of those lots could have a duplex on it. But I, there's probably not room to build another duplex on the lot with the way the lot is developed currently with that with the existing house being right smack in the middle of the lot so it could take some creative design perhaps if someone wanted to but it would also mean removing the existing structure uh, you've got in your packet uh, the application submitted by the applicant uh, which includes a, uh, the analysis required by the transportation planning rule of the impacts of this potential zoning change on the, the city's transportation system. The conclusions uh, uh, of that analysis are that uh, it, it, the zone change and the potential development that could result from the zone change is not expected to have a significant impact on surrounding roadways. Uh, and infrastructure. Uh, it is a, an existing, legally existing non-conforming use. Changing the zoning to medium density would mean the duplex would be a conforming use. Uh, you've got before you the recommendation of approval from the Planning Commission and you've got uh, a draft of Ordinance 1030 uh, which uh, includes a set of recommended findings of fact and conclusions that the seven uh, criteria for approval of a zone map amendment uh, have been addressed by the application uh, and uh, would be approved. Uh, I can answer any questions you have before we turn it over to pu public testimony. 
Mr. Fleischman, I know this is, this seems even a little strange to me, but things change. Mr. Humphreys could go back, let's say this is down zoned, up zoned, what is it, up, down? Up. Sideways, up zoned to multifamily. He could still go back, tear down that duplex and put two single family homes there, couldn't he? 7,000 square foot. Yes. So I mean, so let's if, say that's not. If the duplex, if the duplex was removed, and the lot was partitioned. Now the lot only has, I think it only has a hundred feet of frontage on okay. East Jefferson. So it would need to be a front and back partitioning. It couldn't be side by side. Okay. But but if you go through a, a theoretical. Uh, the lot's large enough to be partitioned mm -hmm. under medium density zoning mm -hmm. into two lots that exceed 7,000 square feet. And under our code today, each of those lots could be developed with either a single family home or, or a duplex. Or a duplex, right. So mm -hmm. the, the quote, worst case scenario for development under the medium density zoning for this property would be two duplexes mm -hmm. for a total of four dwelling units. And that, that probably makes the most economic sense, but that just the idea that you can go you can go back even with that up zone. Yeah, the, the medium density zoning that, that he's asked for would allow a single family home yeah. in yeah. addition to allowing the duplex. And if he was the, the other alternative would be to keep it as one lot and the code would allow a triplex on that okay. lot. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Why ask for it to be up zoned if you were going to build single family stuff on it? Anyway, enough Ms. of that. Mr. Somebody Mayor? else. Go ahead, please. Um, Dan, so would the trips only go up then if if that were, were the scenario where they were to build the two duplexes? Because at this point, because it says that the trips could go up by 25 trips a day, but if they're if it's already a duplex the the amount of trips per day is not changing right, right. so so uh, uh, correct the the transportation planning rule which is a state administrative rule that 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 dictates our analysis whenever we change our zoning map or our comprehensive plan map requires that this analysis that was done not be done based on what the applicant says they're going to do, but what is the worst case scenario that could happen after you change the zoning. And so that's why I tried to describe what I saw as the, the, the quote, worst case, not that there's good or bad about it, but it is the most intense development that would be allowed under medium density zoning would be to get rid of the existing duplex, partition the lot into two, and build a duplex on each of the two new lots, which would cr result in two additional dwelling units besides what's there now. And that's what the analysis that was submitted is based on also. And the conclusion of that traffic engineer was doing that would not have a substantial impact on the transportation system. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Mr. Mayor, um, Dan, uh, if we were to change the zone to the medium density residential, um, are they allowed to add an additional ADU to this lot as it stands? No, our code for ADUs only allows accessory dwelling units to be placed on a lot with a single family home. Okay. So if they did tear it down and do two single family homes, then they could do ADUs. Okay. Right. So, which is but essentially they could like also do two duplexes yeah. and okay. have yeah. two full size okay. units instead of just an, an ADU. Thank you. Okay. All right. Other questions from the council? Anything? Anything? Okay. Let's go to public testimony. Who would like to comment on this proposal at this time? Be brave. <laughs> no one? Okay. Let's go back to questions from the council then. Anything? No? Applicant summary. Mr. Humphreys. Chair. 
guys have discussed this. I don't have much to say about it. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm not planning on tearing it down and building another duplex. <laughs> well, the t I, just want, I just want the zone change. Sure. So, you know, Point of order. Yeah. yeah. Can he go up to the mic? Yeah. Thanks. He can do that. I, I just want the zone change to, to make it right. It mm -hmm. is what it is, and it's been that way since 1949 when it was built. And, and if it had happened to burn down tomorrow, it's like, no, I bought it as a duplex. I didn't buy it as two single family lots right. to build a house or anything like that back. I just want it correct mm -hmm. uh, to where, okay, it burns down tomorrow. I can build another duplex back there and, and be fine. So that, that was my whole mm -hmm. intentions behind getting the zone changed. Super, thank you. You bet. Yeah. Okay. Let's see, where were we before we got that? Uh, staff summary, Dan? Uh, so, uh, the Planning Commission has recommended approval. Uh, you've got their order recommending that uh, in your packet. Staff's recommendation is approval. Um, and uh, staff has presented you with three different options. One, mm -hmm. to approve the application and the ordinance as drafted. Second is approve the application with modifications to the ordinance. And the third would be to deny the ordinance, deny the application, which would mean directing staff to come back with some, mm -hmm. some alternate findings and conclusions uh, to support that decision. Okay, good. All right, Th is that, that it then? That's it for me. Okay, let's go ahead and close the hearing then, and we'll go to council deliberation. So, go ahead, folks. Anything? We got. You heard the um, the options and motions, motions and options. What would we like to do, Mr. Mayor? Yes. I'd like to make a motion to approve the application of Tad Humphreys and Scott Humphreys, the land use file number 1-02-19 and ordinance 1030 as presented. Okay, Second. So that approve that application and the first consideration of ordinance 1030. Right? Yes. Motion and a second. Second. Motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? If not, uh, Alyssa, would you poll the council, please? Of course. Councillor Patty? Yes. Councillor Quigley? Abstain. Councillor Ort? Yes. Councillor Mullen? Yes. Councillor Hook? Yes. Motion passes four to zero. Four to one, actually. Okay, then, so you don't have to remind me. No. Uh-huh, <laughs> yeah. Or do I need to stop you? Which you usually do, uh-huh. Okay, closing state. The City Council's decision may be appealed to the Land Use Board of Appeals within 21 days in accordance with the Oregon Revised Statutes 197.830. Okay. Uh, no unfinished business tonight. Uh, new business, a joint presentation with Planning Commission on Draft Transportation System Plan. Mr. Fleischman. I will be very brief, and um, I'm just here to introduce Susan Wright, who's an engineer with Kittleson Associates, and Darcy, whose last name I'm forgetting, <coughs> Rudzinski, with uh, the Angelo Planning Group. They are the lead consultants in our efforts to update the transportation system plan. You may recall that back in, um, when were we here? Early February, we had a, a sort of progress report presentation. Uh, we're back uh, with a second, a second show and tell. Getting the light, Rich. Yeah. Thank you. I have a few copies with me of the full document. It was, um, I should I hand these to you? Pass out. Is it in our? It was on your electronic packet. If anybody wants a hard, their own personal hard copy, with you there. <coughs> All right, good evening. And yes, lovely new projector. <laughs> Readable tonight. Yes. It actually focuses. <coughs> All right. Um, yeah, my name is Susie Wright. I'm with Kittleson and Associates, and it's been my pleasure working um, with um, the, the, your city staff and the technical and citizen advisory committees that were assembled for this project. Can I get the next slide, please? And my presentation tonight 
is I'm going to try to be pretty, uh, go a little quickly. I have about 10 or 12 slides just to kind of give you an update since the last time I was here. Um, last time I was here, I gave you an update on the kind of where we were at in the alternatives analysis stage, but we had some pretty good idea of what was going into the plan. So there's not been a, a great number of changes since that last uh, briefing, but I'll try to highlight what some of those changes are. Um, and then I'm going to pass the mic over to Darcy Rosinski from Angelo Planning Group, and she's going to talk about some of the things that ultimately will be in your adoption packet along with this document when it comes before you for adoption. When adopting the TSP, there's a few things that also need to be um, adopted to fully implement it, uh, and so that will look take the form of some amendments to the comprehensive plan to bring the um, uh, goals, policies, and objectives into alignment in the transportation section of your comprehensive plan with the updated TSP. And then there's a few amendments to the development code to make sure that on any of the updated um, policies and goals are re kind of reflected in, in the development code. So Darcy is going to talk about those items and that is probably new material uh, to you since the last briefing. So I will try to be um, kind of brief in my re-review of what's in the TSP document. Next slide, please. So just a little recap on our schedule. We started this um, process a little bit more than a year ago. Um, so it's been a pretty nice um, paced project and I'm, looking, I'm happy to be here. And the next steps uh, moving forward from today, we will welcome any of your um, questions and comments um, on the document and then ultimately it will be coming before the Planning Commission uh, for an adoption hearing in uh, May and then hopefully before the Council in June. Next slide please. So the TSP is organized in a, a series of chapters, starting with an introduction, followed by goals, objectives, and evaluation criteria. And that's the chapter that's primarily, um, Darcy will be talking about getting into alignment with the goals and policies uh, in the comprehensive plan. And it also includes some of the evaluation criteria and the things that we were looking at in the transportation system to make sure that we were uh, implementing our, uh, the goals and objectives. Then the plan is uh, broken up into modal chapters with a uh, chapter for the pedestrian plan, bicycle plan, transit plan, motor vehicle plan, um, a chapter that covers a few other modes, um, uh, such as kind of water, for example, um, and uh, for water for transportation. Um, and then there's a chapter on kind of funding, implementation, and monitoring, and a glossary of terms. Next slide, please. So just kind of a few highlights in the pedestrian plan. So the pedestrian plan includes identification of um, existing and future sidewalks. And one of the items that was uh, new since the briefing uh, was the addition of crosswalk study locations. These are locations where uh, we either fa saw the need or received um, comments through the public participation on the need for crosswalks. And these are identified in the TSP um, as kind of potential crosswalk study locations. Uh, we think they're all good locations. You probably wouldn't do this full number on uh, First Avenue, but really before implementing a crosswalk, each one needs its own a little bit more in-depth study uh, it's particularly looking into the type, the warrants for what type of treatment would be best at that location. Uh, this chapter was also updated to just kind of note that um, ADA, so uh, curb ramps and accessibility, is an important part of the pedestrian um, system. The TSP doesn't include an inventory um, of all the city's existing curb ramps or their um, uh, status as far as being up to standard, <coughs> but it does note that they're an important part of the overall system. Uh, through the, um, this final phase of the project, we were, uh, got a lot of feedback on um, phasing and priorities, and uh, one of the, the tier two projects here highlighted in yellow through that process moved from high priority to medium priority as part of us trying to balance uh, what was kind of in and outside of the financially constrained plan. Next slide, please. Uh, so the bicycle plan identifies um, uh, existing uh, bicycle facilities as well as the proposed uh, additions to the bicycle network in the form of new bike lanes or shared lanes. Uh, the TSP really identifies um, Ida Street as a corridor. Uh, 
uh, that should have uh, continue to be a kind of a shared facility with bicycles and vehicles sharing the road, but formalizing that a little bit with um, signage uh, about sharing the road and to inform both um, cyclists uh, that this is a good alternative route to some others, uh, as well as informing vehicles. Uh, and we also have that same designation as a shared uh, facility along 3rd Street and have identified 3rd Street really from Water to Whitney as that alternative route to 1st Avenue because the TSP does not include a plan to widen 1st Avenue to include bike lanes. Next slide, please. So the roadway, uh, the motor vehicle plan um, identifies um, has a number of kind of elements from the roadway functional classification map, which I'll talk about, location of new streets, as well as improvements. One of the major changes in the, uh, the proposed transportation system plan compared to the previous one was removing some of the uh, planned road widenings, uh, essentially removing all the planned widenings that were to take some of your existing roads up to five lanes, um, such as Golf Club Road, Shaft Road, Wilco Road. Our kind of updated forecast um, has really um, kind of helped show that those widenings are not anticipated to be to be needed, and so we we um, backed all of those down in the TSP to just a future cross section of three lanes, <coughs> which is one lane in each direction with the center turn lane, primarily on the arterials. We also included some um, narrowing of travel lanes in the design standards, taking some of the proposed uh, or standard 12-foot lanes down to 11-foot lanes on arterials and 11-foot lanes to 10-foot lanes in neighborhood collectors. Um, this is kind of kind of um, a little bit status quo for the transportation industry, which has really found that those uh, reductions have no negative impact to safety. In fact more frequently have a positive impact on safety and give you back, reduce your pervious surface as well as give you some um, space to uh, help in, uh, install additional water treatment facilities to help with um, uh, drainage which would be necessary as you, uh, you know, increase um, or continue to build um, sidewalks and upgrade some of your unimproved roadways. Next slide please. Um, there was only a few changes to the roadway functional classification since our last briefing, and those were up around uh, the future Quail Run extension and the Junco Road extension up in the northwest corner. Just a little bit of um, kind of discussion on what was going to be a local street versus a neighborhood collector. Um, it, but uh, those were some of the only new changes, but there was a few changes when I came to the last briefing, uh, namely around um, uh, Pine Street and Virginia Street to be uh, neighborhood collectors. This map also shows some of the future local street connections in gray. And if you go to the next slide, please. Um, this map specifically highlights the future roadway, ex roadway extensions. Um, <clears throat> the roadways in orange are the future collectors. These projects have been included on the project list so that they can be included in the city's um, system development charge calculations. Uh, the blue routes are future neighborhood collectors, uh, which um, would, would, similar to the black lines, which are local streets, would be built um, by development through development. Uh, and uh, the local streets and the neighborhood collectors um, are not kind of in the capital list of projects as they d uh, do not need to be included in the city's SDCs to get constructed. All right, next slide please. Uh, the the Roadway, the vehicle plan of improvements. We have a series of intersection improvements that we talked about at the last meeting, which I'll kind of take you through uh, each of them, kind of what was the final preferred um, solution. Uh, but we've identified in black a number of um, improvements, primarily for safety on um, Highway 22, but noting that these are outside of um, the city, but just uh, kind of expressing your uh, the city's um, uh, support for uh, safety improvements to Highway 22. And the projects there in um, orange and pink are primarily in red, the projects within um, the city uh, and that are included in uh, kind of the project list that would uh, move forward to your system development charge calculations. Next slide, please. 
So those projects uh, there that were kind of shown in pink, orange, and uh, red uh, are all identified in this top table eight. So these are some of the major or most significant um, roadway projects in the TSP. You'll note that there is a uh, roundabout proposed at the Golf Club Road, Shaft Road intersection, as well as at Staten Road and Wilco Road. And I have some sketches in here I'll um, kind of refresh you on. Um, we have the Golf Lane realignment to, uh, um, to intersect uh, where Whitney Street is at Cascade. Uh, and this project would be primarily if to serve um, that Golf Lane area. Uh, in the event of um, uh, expansion of the city limits into the urban uh, expansion area at that north end of town. Uh, we have uh, improvements to the kind of series of S curves on the 6th Avenue, uh, on 6th Avenue as well as 10th Avenue. Um, and a minor improvement to the first in Washington intersection uh, near downtown to bring back uh, that protected left turn. Um, <coughs> to get off of, um, off of First Avenue. And that's recommended as a protected permissive left turn, which is one of the traffic signals where you have um, both types of left turn. Well, you, you will at times get a green arrow saying you have a protection to turn left. And at other times uh, when traffic is light, you would get a flashing yellow arrow indicating you're allowed to turn left uh, if there's no traffic. But that will help alleviate um, kind of both what uh, the conversion was trying to alleviate a long time ago as well as the difficulties you're experiencing there now. And then the bottom um, four projects are those future um, collector streets uh, that are included on this list for the purpose of uh, being able to include them in the um, city's uh, system development charges. Um, so that there can be some credits for those roads uh, to developers as, as these areas develop. Next slide, please. And so just to kind of go through some of the those uh, intersection improvements, this is the um, roundabout at Golf Club Road and Shaft Road. Uh, and city staff had a meeting with uh, Marion County staff to kind of review each of these um, proposals and make sure that we had concurrence there. And we also ran uh, track turning templates through each of them to identify, um, kind of clarify and confirm that these can uh, accommodate uh, both the uh, large trucks as well as uh, farm equipment that might use them or that will use them. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the Wilco Road, uh, Staten Road roundabout, which uh, allows that intersection to be improved for all modes and still keep all five legs of the intersection um, uh, included in the intersection. Next slide, please. This is the uh, 6th Avenue um, S-curves, uh, which you see at the um, North Street. We're showing um, an always stop and the south intersection there, um, a free-flowing uh, turn, much like you have today, except with the kind of removal of the east leg of that intersection, just kind of blocking it off as a, a local street. Next slide. And this is the 10th Avenue S-curves, uh, where we're um, kind of uh, emphasizing the free-flowing um, uh, curve on the southern intersection, making the um, side street more of a T uh, instead of a little bit am ambiguous as to who has the right of way, with the intersection at uh, the north end uh, proposed as a uh, mini roundabout. Next slide, please. So that the, um, <clears throat> kind of summarizes all the projects that are in the plan. Uh, so we went through an exercise to add up, you know, what, are, what is this, uh, the total of all of the projects in the transportation system plan? And they total approximately $71 million. But we have kind of identified what are the highest priority projects as the high priority list and those projects that we are considering part of the financially constrained plan. Um, and that plan includes uh, all of the kind of intersection improvements that I um, talked to you through as well as um, all of the tier one projects for bicycle uh, and pedestrian projects. Next slide. So with that, I'm open to kind of any questions or comments before um, kind of yielding the mic to Darcy to talk to you about some of the implementation items. Uh, questions, please, go ahead. Somebody, anyone? Mr. Mayor. Yes. Uh, first off, it's 
I am so impressed by the plan, uh, even more so the second time around. Um, and I have a question. I, th I think it might be more for Keith on it. Uh, I see that big price tag, and I'm curious if there is um, a portion of like the road tax um, that we put through plus the state tax that the governor had put through um, that can be used for these improvements and like how like not how how much would it impact that cost if it can be used <coughs> um, there has been discussions with staff about um, how to fund these projects um, and we have also discussed other mechanisms just beyond the gas tax for funding options as well we have reached out to Marion County um, Marion County pleasantly said that they realized this was something they need to be a partner on. What that meant or what that will, will eventually become, I can't say at this time. So so really what we're looking at is, is opportunities out from the county, from the state uh, for funding and then potentially other funding opportunities um, that we've discussed as well. Because the price tags are so significant, I think it's going to be on, beyond just our normal street tax funding. Yeah, I can add a little bit to that. Um, our kind of summary of how many, how much funds were available for the financially constrained plan to getting to that $14 million uh, did include both the um, state gas tax and local gas tax and assumption of some, some level of annual grants um, as well as SDC funds. Um, but as we looked at your current um, kind of revenues for um, street projects, where we had a little bit of kind of ambiguity in understanding how much of this could we fund was in looking at your kind of annual budget for maintenance. And a lot of these pedestrian and bicycle projects you could consider um, maintenance projects or might have uh, been things that the city has already been incorporating when they can into some of their uh, ma maintenance projects, which are primarily pavement preservation, but sometimes those include um, the enhancement of the sidewalks. So we had to kind of, we, this, that $14 million budget still is assuming 60% um, of those um, funds uh, still going towards just pure maintenance activities. So, um, so there is still a little bit of kind of wiggle room. It, or um, not wiggle room, but this is uh, still assuming that there might still be some additional maintenance funds that could be used for some of these projects. Um, but you are not alone at all in kind of the portion of the overall TSP uh, that we're able to at this time say is financially constrained. Um, the budget estimates did not assume any contributions from Marion County, which was probably uh, excessively conservative. Um, so that, that does um, present some potential additional opportunity. Somebody else? Mr. Mayor? Yes, go ahead. So on the Shaft Road, um, you're talking about turning it into, or yeah, turning it into like a three lane instead of the five lane. Um, there have been people that have come and expressed safety concerns, um, make, making left turns to their residence. Um, will this address any of that or allevi like alleviate any of, of those concerns, the safety issues, or did anyone come to you with any of that? I did not hear any concerns about not um, widening that road to five lanes. Now some of Shaft Road doesn't, I don't believe, is fully completed with a center turn lane, so that having a center turn lane throughout the entire length um, will be a safety uh, benefit and make it a little bit easier to get in and out of um, people's driveways. Um, I think it also helps control the overall speed of the facility versus a five lane as well as um, the amount of traffic on that facility. Um, kind of maintaining it as a three lane facility, people are still encouraged to um, take you know other routes throughout town. We're fortunate to have a pretty nice um, roadway grid. Um, so widening to five lanes would really only kind of continue to attract kind of more people to that facility instead of, you know, continuing out um, kind of on their local, more local east-west streets to get out to first or to um, uh, Wilco, for example, instead of, you know, heading north because that's the largest facility. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, um, so I, I, I hope that we've addressed their concerns. Certainly. I just... 
Mr. Mayor, I, yes. not that I necessarily feel like it should be a five lane road. I feel like that might might in, encourage people to speed even more so on there, but I just wanted to know if, if you thought that the three lane would help with that um, safety concern, so thank you. I, Mr. Mayor, I have one more question. Yes. Oh. So when we did I'm our... Still asking. When we did our uh, previous uh, plan, we anticipated a significantly higher growth than we have now. So what do we do in the event, you know, now we've, um, we've kind of tapered it down, but what do we do in the event that, you know, if we go in the opposite direction? How do we, maybe this is a Dan question, do we have like, do we anticipate any of that or, or not? Or how does that work? You're asking what if our projections are lower than we expected, or what if they end up being um, higher than we expected? If they're, say that they're lower, or yeah, than we expected, if we have more growth. Yeah, I mean, I think if they're, they're lower, it primarily impacts your ability to fund it, these improvements if you have lower growth. You have lower, lo less development to help provide some of the frontage improvements and to contribute to SDCs and then ultimately pay some of the taxes. Um, so you would just not be able to progress as fast at implementing some of the projects. Um, <coughs> but I think by the nature of us having removed a significant number of the kind of true capacity increasing projects from the um, from the plan it allows the city's kind of SDCs to be more um, kind of in check with the real needs um, and responsive to kind of lower or higher growth. Uh, the good thing is TSPs do tend to be updated every five to ten years so um, we don't have to not revisit it for another 20 years it will get uh, will get revisited um, and the city even on a more frequent basis than that has some ability to, to look at uh, their SDCs and, and um, see if they're uh, kind of reflective of what the needs are where you might be able to put more projects in the SDCs um, than we've estimated if, if um, you know the economy and growth happens you know faster than we might have expected. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, I'm going to be personally interested in, not that I live there or anything, but just uh, a, a continuing kind of aggravation, and that is uh, we need to finish the sidewalks on Ida Street. Mm -hmm. We've got kids going to school and walking literally in the street because part of it. Uh, I need to read this and see what, what uh, kind of priority you assign to that. I. It isn't reasonable to want you to go back through those slides, but um, I'm hoping that got a, a good look uh, in the in the planning and thinking. So that's me, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I would also actually be interested in what you had said about Ida Street. Yeah. Okay. Everyone's got a thought on roundabouts. <laughs> One of the old relics that I drink coffee with in the morning, content, whenever we talk about roundabouts, we did this morning, he brings up an incident, he was driving in Paris and got caught in one on the inside lanes and could not get out. And uh, re refreshes our memory of the, the horror of, of roundabouts uh, anytime anyone even mentions the name or the thing like like I did this morning. So there's that out there too. I think he's confusing that with centrifugal force, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it yes. could have been. Yeah, Europe has some very large roundabouts that aren't quite roundabouts, but they're circular, yeah. large circular, and that multi-lane, yeah. these are all single lane. Yeah, um, right. No, I know. Very, <laughs> very clear where to get, get on and get off. Uh, anyway, thank you. Yep, uh, other thoughts, questions? Mr. Yes. Mayor, I'll offer a thought. Um, I was on this, uh, on, on the on the planning, or sorry, on the planning behind this from the from the start of it, and at first it was very esoteric for me. I'm like, uh, okay, I'm kind of lost here. The first meeting, but it evolved, and the level of uh, co collaboration between uh, the team that was putting it together and the community. They had multiple open houses, multiple opportunities for the folks to come and comment on it and uh, identify certain projects and all that was listened to, heard, and I think the resulting, pro uh, resulting product is fantastic. So let's see how it goes from this point forward. So I appreciate your effort and uh, good job. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, I just have one comment. Um, 
I was uh, a little surprised when they said that this was in our electronic packet because I was on the electronic packet and I didn't see it in there. So I was just curious if it was in a different version somewhere that I'm not clicking on the website. It, it was not part of the packet for the council meeting. Okay, that's what uh, I you, thought. I was you understanding. Were sent an email ah. last mm, Tuesday or Wednesday. I'm still locked out of my email. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. Um, with a link to the draft TSP and uh, technical memo five, which we'll be talking about next. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Totally okay. clarified now. Yeah. Anything else? Um, Darcy's going to come up and talk to you a little bit about the implementation. And okay. I f did um, the copies I provided go all the way around? I have one extra copy. I'd be happy to leave uh, okay. as well. That's, all right. If that's, needed. That's because I have an extra one already. Okay. Ah. Okay. Uh, and so I also brought copies of uh, Level 5. Okay. <laughs> well, traffic. The traffic's terrible. Um, Darcy Rodzinski, thank you very much for your time this evening. And I, too, just have a handful of slides. And I'm happy to uh, answer questions as we go through. Or if you want to wait till I uh, take a breath and, and ask questions about um, some proposed uh, <laughs> policy and code amendments. Um, so we can go to the first slide there. Um, so basically, at the very basic level, we just want to make sure that your um, policy framework related to transportation is consistent with your brand new uh, system plan um, and that you have uh, also um, development requirements that will enable uh, future development to help you, you know, actualize, help you see those uh, improvements um, to your uh, system as you go forward. Um, so that's what I was charged to do with Dan. And uh, I go to the next slide there. Uh, we'll talk about the comprehensive plan first. Um, so the tech memo that you have uh, will basically, you won't need it once you get your packet for uh, the first uh, evidentiary hearing um, because the text will be proposed as a legislative amendment to your comprehensive plan. So that'll be part of, of Dan's uh, staff report to you. Uh, the memo is kind of nice because it gives you a little bit of background of, of why we're doing it and, and uh, what uh, the process was, uh, but ultimately you'll be, um, you will have a packet with, with proposed language. Um, so for comp plan, it's chapter four transportation and it's really that the language that you see is intended to replace uh, your existing goals, policies, and action items. The goals are the same ones that are in the TSP, uh, but the objectives of the TSP have been modified a little bit to provide uh, more policy type language, provide a little bit better direction moving forward. Uh, when you're making uh, land use decisions, for example, and you're asking an applicant to address policy, those policies are gonna make a little bit more sense in your comprehensive plan than looking at the objectives of the TSP. Um, so the TSP objectives basically become now policies and or action items, again, kind of depending on what the, the original TSP objective was. Um, right now in the uh, memo, the, the language is not underlined. Again, it's intended to be replaced. We can go to the next slide there. Um, but it wasn't that we completely threw out the existing policies and action items that you have. You had a lot of really good uh, direction, a lot of uh, very good framework for transportation uh, decisions. So some of that was retained, updated a little bit. Uh, these are kind of the, some of the newer areas uh, that you didn't have a super strong emphasis on, but that your comprehensive, or that your TSP definitely does. So we wanted to match up and, and bring up to date uh, some of those policy statements as well. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Um, the regulatory amendments for your land use and development code, um, just a handful of 
tweaks really uh, we didn't find a lot to update which was nice you have a really solid code uh, pretty easy to understand and again Dan was helpful in identifying some of the areas that could be brought up to snuff and we really were looking at um, compliance with the transportation planning rule which was brought up earlier uh, tonight so the first uh, the first kind of bullet there really was uh, just about your development appro uh, approval procedures making sure that when you do update your land use code um, that it is consistent with the transportation planning rules a little bit of a crosswalk to uh, to the state requirements there just codifying that uh, you're doing it in practice already but this just lets everybody know that that's that's a requirement uh, site plan review approval criteria you know making sure when you condition approval that uh, for um, transportation impacts that you're conditioning uh, proportionate to the expected impacts of that uh, that proposal so again um, just good kind of legalistic type language to have in your code. Um, the last two there, uh, pedestrian and bicycle connections, you have a really solid uh, connectivity and circulation standards uh, section already, um, so requirements um, for subdivisions, but you didn't really have much by way of making sure there were safe connections for non-motorized transportation, so that's a little bit of additional language, don't forget about pedestrians trying to make their way through your, uh, through your development site, for example. And then there's a brand new section that's proposed uh, related to access to transit, and this would be uh, only for new retail office and institutional uses. Uh, but again, to um, accommodate uh, transit as a as a use, making sure that you know building orientation and um, access ways, crosswalks, etc., are are uh, there for folks that are using their feet or a bike to get to that transit stop. So the next slide. Uh, also some uh, development standards um, related to off-street parking. Um, a little bit of a proposed reduction or um, some uh, modification to uh, to parking lot or uh, parking space uh, dimensions when a proposed uh, development would be accommodating things that might um, necessitate a little less parking, like if they were accommodating a carpool or van pool space, you might give a, a little reduction and your code now allows you to do that so you don't have to provide quite as many um, parking spaces as you normally would. Uh, if you were uh, proposing something near uh, a bus stop, an existing or planned bus stop, and I know transit's a little bit limited, but thinking future, uh, again, you'd be able to um, permit a little bit of a reduction in off-street uh, required off-stream parking spaces. Um, and then the other two uh, little bullets there really have uh, everything to do with making sure your code is consistent with your uh, street classifications and also the street um, cross-section standards that are updated now in your transportation system plan as well as in your public works design standards. Um, so making sure all three of those documents are consistent and where appropriate that your development standards are really pointing to your public works design standards which is where you go for all the measurements. Um, and then the next slide. Um, and, and this is really uh, just why you want to do these amendments. Again, very modest. Uh, if you look at the memo, uh, there are six discrete uh, kind of sections of your development code that are uh, proposed to be updated. Um, you just want to make sure that, that what you're requiring uh, future development to do is consistent with your, um, with your system so you don't get develop land development and your transportation system out of whack. You want them to support each other. Um, and I think that really is all for me. If we have any questions about any of the language that's proposed, i um, be happy to try to answer that or I will uh, ask Dan. Sure. Questions, anyone? Hmm? Neat presentation. Great. Mr. Mayor, I have one one Go question. Ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I am curious about, like, this is a great plan, and I was having a question for uh, Keith, actually. This is not something that our city staff could have ever had the capacity to do based on time and all the other projects that they're working on. Like, I, I kind of want to emphasize like how important it was for us to have this done um, because you guys are all, it seems like you're all so busy with um, everything else. Because uh, I just, I want the community to know like how important it was that we did this. 
updating the master plans has been, uh, I think, a priority that we've talked about for, for several years now and, and beginning, and you'll see in the upcoming budget uh, another proposal for a master plan update as well. So this has been uh, something we identified as a need, and, and there is a cost with this, obviously, but um, you know, the council putting a priority on this and, and being engaged and active in this is, is obviously part of a successful process. So this is just one of uh, you know, the ones we're trying to continue on and check off as we continue to move forward and updating these plans. So it's, it's been a, a great process. Awesome, thanks. And, and I, okay. I, I don't want to begin to imply that we're not busy, but besides the fact that we don't have the time to work on a project like this, staff does not have the technical expertise mm -hmm. that the consultants bring, particularly with the traffic forecasting, the traffic engineering, the street design, mm -hmm. etc. So we do occasionally need to reach out and hire the expertise that, that we can't have in staff. We don't have traffic engineers on staff. Thank you for making that point. I think it's important for everyone to know that. Okay, I guess we're good. Um, and the next step is a public, there's a public uh, present. Yeah, next, um, ha having not heard a great hue and cry from, from the council tonight, I think we're ready to, to proceed uh, with beginning the adoption process. Okay. Uh, that starts with uh, required uh, notice to the Department of Land Conservation and Development that w that we are having a post adoption plan amendment um, process, uh, and we will do that this week uh, with the idea that this will will schedule a public hearing before the Planning Commission at their May meeting, uh, with the idea that we'll be back before you at your second meeting in June for your public hearing and an ordinance for adoption of the TSP, the Comprehensive Plan Amendments, and the Land Use Code Amendments that, that Darcy just explained. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah. Let's go on to... Um, Ordinance 1031 and the new business, amending licensing standards for mobile food units. Um, Mr. Fleischman, when oh. you're ready. When you're ready. No, it's all right. I wanted to ask Ralph. He brought most of his planning commission with him tonight, but I don't know. We we had uh, we had three of the five members yeah. of the planning commission here yeah. tonight. And I just was kind of sitting here wondering if there was something that Ralph wanted or the group wanted. No, they were here to they were invited to hear this presentation. Wonderful. Prior okay. to so okay. they wouldn't be going into the public hearing without any background. Okay. Good. All right. Okay. Uh, that next thing is 10:31. Uh, Mr. Fleischman, you, you're on again. Thank you. Um, so the issue before you this evening is consideration of an ordinance that would amend the current uh, restrictions in city code on the location of food trucks, formerly known as in our code as mobile food units. Um, last May, the council enacted ordinance 1018 that established the requirement that food trucks obtain a local license uh, from the city uh, and uh, enacted some standards for the operation of food trucks uh, in the city. Uh, as enacted last year, the code requires that food trucks be on private property and not operate uh, or park uh, on the public street. Uh, in addition to other regulations, but it is the location uh, on the street uh, that we bring before you tonight. As a result of a conversation that we had with the proprietors of uh, Snow Peak Brewery, uh, staff is proposing to amend the standards 
to allow food trucks to be parked in the street under certain circumstances. Uh, we have uh, looked at the uh, how can we do it safely uh, to not risk uh, uh, the safety of the patrons of food trucks, uh, to not uh, risk uh, congesting traffic flow, etc. Uh, the police chief and I have worked on these together and what we are recommending is that food trucks be permitted to set up in the street right away provided the street is a local street not an arterial or collector as we just discussed about functional classification in the TSP um, but not on North 3rd Avenue our main our downtown main street uh, the food truck uh, must be parked in a legal parking space, which uh, means at least 20 feet from the crosswalk at an intersection, away from a fire hydrant, etc. Uh, the service window must face the curb, so patrons aren't standing out in the travel way while they order their food. Uh, and the food truck must be adjacent to a sidewalk with a minimum width of six feet, so that again patrons standing at the order window are not we don't risk blocking the sidewalk from other pedestrian traffic or they won't be standing in a in a plant a, a grass plant or what should be a grass planting strip but but would soon be worn away um, so uh, notice of the proposed amendment uh, was provided to uh, while my staff report says all licensed food truck operators, we did not have uh, email addresses for all of them, but for all of them that, that we could contact. Um, Ken Carey, who is the proprietor of uh, the uh, Spud Bus or Loaded Baked Potatoes, whatever his business is called, uh, contacted me uh, by email today saying he had intended to be here tonight to speak on it uh, about the code amendments but but couldn't make it and just wanted uh, me to relay his thanks to the city for considering these amendments and and that he would be supportive of them um, so with that staff recommends enactment of ordinance 1031 as presented and uh, I will, I and or the chief will answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Questions for either Mr. Fleischman or Chief Stevens? About Mr. Mayor. Yes, go ahead, please. Um, why no food trucks on 3rd Avenue? North 3rd. North 3rd. North 3rd. My, my concern was because uh, the biggest reason is because of visibility uh, for uh, because of the narrowness and the and how close the businesses are to each other and people getting around and being able to see as they're going around corners and having a, a food truck that uh, generally they're taller taller vehicles uh, you know vans type UPS vehicle size uh, parked there. But the other reason was is because of it just out of consideration of the other businesses downtown. Uh, if a food truck comes and parks in front of uh, uh, one of the other businesses that's open downtown, uh, I could see them not being happy that a uh, somebody parked right there and is blocking the view that their store is there uh, and having a line up uh, for people to get food right in front of their business. It, it, that was my concern. Chief follow-up question on that does third avenue break north and south at washington is there a south third avenue no uh, anything south of town is south of water street uh, of like anything that has a south address is everything else is north oh, okay from water street right. north see i had this Odd think that maybe North Third was north of Washington and the grade school and whatnot would be interference with food carts. <coughs> so there's, yep. it's all North Third. I, I, was, I was told at one time the reason they block, they put the North South uh, split at Water Street is that the town fathers assumed that this, the town would go further south than mm -hmm. where it is. Or the river, yeah, it's good. A lot of room to grow down there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions. Mr. Mayor. Yes. 
Chief, I have a question um, about the North Third Avenue uh, restriction for these food carts. Wouldn't the number two on here where it uh, talks about being parked at least 20 feet from a crosswalk at an intersection fix the visibility issue of going around corners? Yes, to, to, to some extent. Um, I've been down there when, when the, there's been UPS or, or delivery trucks parked uh, down in front of City Hall or in front of the police department and you come around, the, you know, just kind of just looking down the street. They're just, it's just, <coughs> it gives the feeling of a very large blockage, you know, as you're looking down the street trying to see where you're at and what's there because of the, the closeness of the buildings. But it does help. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Follow up question. Go ahead. Um, would a, like a time, and I don't know if this is a good idea, it's an idea. Would a time limit for how long the food trucks could be parked along the streets assist in that, do you believe, with the, the issue of like visibility or obstructing the view of someone's business, like so they're not there all day? I, I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm curious as to why. Third Avenue is uh, kind of set out versus uh, and excluded versus other businesses, maybe on Second or I don't know. I guess I don't know. I don't understand where you can have a food truck if you can't have it on Third Avenue. Is it just one business you can have a food truck at then, like the Snow Peak place? I don't. I don't get. I don't it. think there's be down Second Street. They could have them. Uh, assuming the sidewalks are wide enough Correct. to meet the other criterion, um, this would provide opportunity for food trucks on on the side, the east-west side streets, Water, Florence, High, Marion, Marion Burnett, uh, as well as Second Ave. Um, and while I don't see any locating there. Uh, a small portion of North 4th Ave is zoned to allow um, eating and drinking places. Mr. Mayor. The 3rd the, the, the <coughs> Ave is our, is our main street. Uh, it has the heaviest concentration of, of, of retail uh, business activity along the street. Uh, it has um, we we are likely, um, as was presented to council a couple of meetings ago, uh, we are likely to lose a number of parking spaces, which will further um, constrain the availability of parking uh, in the downtown area. And I think part of our thinking also was to, you know, not that we're going to see a line of food trucks parked during the day, but to to not take up available customer parking uh, with food trucks on Third Ave, our main downtown retail strip, so to speak. That was the other thought that went into it. One one possibility, um, you know, I had the conversation with Mr. Mesa last week, um, who who commented earlier this evening. I have not talked to Chief about it would be perhaps to allow, on 3rd Ave, perhaps allow them after 4.30 or 5 o'clock. Um, but still, you have the issue of parking for the theater, uh, and things like that. So that's, that's you know, basically why when we were setting out the what are the parameters for where we want to locate them, we said we probably shouldn't be allowing them on 3rd Ave. Okay. Mr. Mayor, yes. another follow-up question. Another one. Uh, so, let's take Marion for Marion Street for an example. Um, if that's one of, if the sidewalks were wide enough um, and they were 20 feet from each intersection, potentially couldn't there be food trucks lined all along Marion, then obstructing the view of those businesses um, because they're concentrated there? If if they decide to all collect in that area, if. if each food truck decided Good. they wanted to park on Marion, and and whatever business is there now is blocked by food trucks with no parking. There aren't, there are not 
businesses that with their frontage on Marion. I mean, you've got Covered Bridge at the corner. U.S. Bank. You've got okay, U.S. Any Bank. Any other street. With, well, <laughs> right. And, and again, there, there really isn't. I mean, Ida's got some, some businesses with that front on Ida. But yes, you have that possibility, but you don't have the, 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 the issue of visibility at the intersections. And again, you, staying 20 feet back will help resolve that. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Mayor. Dan, I have a question regarding Ida Street, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Adjacent to uh, Snow Peaks, right? <laughs> Is that sidewalk then not six feet? Fitting the width requirement. Snow, first, Snow Peak is on Water Street, not Ida. Oh, is it Water? I'm looking at the wrong. Yeah. Sorry, I apologize. Yeah. And um, that's the sidewalk there down on Water Street is probably nine feet in width. Okay. In front of in front of um, the Water Control District, Snow Peak, and the Body Shop. I'm looking at rumors. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. You folks ready to think about this some more or want to talk about it some more? Or? Mr. Mayor. Yes. I don't think Staten's going to be the destination for any food cut food car truck race uh, on video anytime soon. Um, having said that, what I mean by that is I don't see this flood of blue trucks coming in there and taking up the street. Um, I would like to see what we could do to help these folks a little bit more than just say Third Street's off limits. Uh, maybe the hour thing might be a good situation to look at. Maybe we include in their fee uh, to bid on a portion of the street or have a couple designated spots for the food trucks and have them designate to bid on those when they come open. And on the further ends, say, say closer to Water Street and closer to, I don't know, Washington. And first come bid that week or whatever gets that one, and then you rotate. I don't know. Maybe it rotates. I don't know. Just something to. I feel like we're just slamming it down and saying, "Okay, but except for this street." And to, to Mr. Mason's point, I get what he's saying. At the same time, I don't really think that the government should be regulating how business comes and goes. What essentially he's asking is that we don't let any other person, another business, a food business, park in front of his business, right? Yeah. So that's my suggestions. I don't know. Just, just thinking. Okay. Anyone else on this? Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Um, I feel like it just doesn't seem fair to the potential businesses that it could affect because we're supposed to look at like worst case scenario. Because um, I know there. You know, there have been some advertisements out on the internet for, hey, we're going to have all these food trucks um, coming to state and come, come stop by. Um, and yeah, they collect in, uh, I've seen them collect like on a property, uh, kind of if you go towards Sio, like at the end of, I don't know where that, where that east or west or whatever, but anyway, at the end of, of the city and downtown area. And if we allow them to start, you know, parking on the street, they're going to figure out where they can park and where they can kind of gather the most people. And so it doesn't really seem fair for it to potentially affect even one business worse than another business. It should be fair for all the businesses and not just restrict one street and protect those businesses from having someone park in front of theirs. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I do think it's kind of vague with the 20 foot restriction or the six foot width the restriction, not knowing what sidewalks those are. Do we know exactly which sidewalks those are downtown? I mean, you'd have to go back and look, right? But North Third Ave from Water to Burnett okay. has nine foot sidewalks. Okay. And some of north of Burnett may also have nine foot sidewalks. The uh, Second Ave from water probably also to Burnett okay. maybe just to Marion has nine foot sidewalks okay. the um, cross streets 
Um, well, the exception to water is between, I mean, the exception to second is between water and Florence where there's no. essentially no right. sidewalk right. Right. because it's been that vacant lots there for who knows how long. Um, the, the, the east west side streets, water's got uh, eight or nine foot sidewalks. Um, Florence does, Ida does, High does, Marion may not all the way. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so to that point, can we can we ask for like specific? I don't know if this is overstepping, so just let me know. Uh, can we ask for like it to be either like have at your office when they come and ask for permits to say these are the permitted areas? Because uh -huh. you know if they if someone says, well, I I think this is a six foot you know sidewalk and and we decide it's not then you know we have an issue no, it, would, it would excuse me but it, it would be very easy to prepare a map showing the, the okay. permissible locations that'd be great and then oh, I had another question I should have written, written it down um, oh so when forgive me I don't know the process of this but when someone comes to get a permit, does it last for a specific amount of time? Like how long are people are gonna be able to park in one specific location? Is it just for a day, a time period, overnight? They, they, they don't get a permit to park in a specific location. Okay. They obtain a license to operate within the city and then need to operate within the, co the locational confines of the code. Mm -hmm. So while I believe that the license application form has a spot on it to indicate where they're going to set up, um, but I'm not quite sure that, that it actually does because they're not getting a permit or a license for a particular location. Um, it really is it be, would become an enforcement issue from the enforcement staff should someone be set up in the wrong location or be operating without a license. Okay. Uh, the license is good for one year. Okay. Chief Stevens, you had a question. I hope yeah. I guess it was, a, it was a comment. It was an option to try. Um, since the the parking on third is. Um, it is with with the twenty foot rule it, the the biggest issue is blocking of of other businesses uh, that you could try it and and see how it goes knowing that you may have to come back and uh, um, and and narrow it down if we get too many complaints we could bring a map uh, potentially too that would illustrate where they could park with that conditions yeah the council seems to be I don't want to put words anywhere uh, seems to be um, thinking about maybe, th does this need, with all respect to the work you guys have already done, uh, does this need more thinking? You folks go ahead, somebody had a question or you had a question. Mr. Mayor, I, I was actually uh, gonna ask if we could possibly see a map of current permissible locations prior to making a decision so we can make a better informed decision um, on what the impact would be. If the council would like to table this and then and have us come back with more information and kind of take the comments we got and have a you know map what it's gonna look like and I think Dan did a nice job of trying but just to, to explain yeah. where the areas would be and, and to give sure. a better visual guide than and you know trying to do it mentally or on the phones. Yeah. Thank you. Someone like to offer Mr. more Mayor? to the table? Yeah. Oh Go ahead. I just had another thought though. Um, what are your thoughts on having like a a time restriction or a, um, to Councilor Hook's point of um, so many gathering in one specific spot or do we care about that until we see the map? I think uh, just I don't want to talk out of turn here. I think we bring the map back like we suggested uh, verbally and I'm looking at this again and speaking to um, my co counterpart over here that doesn't talk very much. 
uh, I think verbally there's enough options, right? Now we put it on a piece of paper to look at it, and that gives us a better clarity as to what we're looking at from a higher level. Okay. I don't want to speak for you, but that's what I think, so. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> Say something. Agreed. <laughs> okay. So. Man of uh, many words. <laughs> So Mr. Mr. Mayor, I'd like the uh, uh, direct staff to bring this back with a map that shows us the current locations there where uh, this would impact. Okay. If that makes Seconded. sense. Okay. We'll, we'll be back with a map Thank you. that shows where food trucks may be located should Ordinance 1031 pass as currently drafted. Can you include Third Avenue just to see, just for sure. giggles? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can we do that with just yes. without some formal, just a directive back to staff Done. on this? Done. Okay, thank you. All right, good. Thank you. Woo. Okay, uh, State and City Council rules update. Ms. Angelo and Mr. Campbell. Go ahead. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm going to start, preface this by the agenda it does say action. This We're not asking for action tonight. It's just informational, so... No decision tonight. Um, in your packet, you have a lot of information, um, but we wanted to be sure that you had everything that we considered when putting these council rules together. Um, on January 22nd, Councillor Quigley requested a review of the council rules, and I began to do a little bit of research. I reached out to my network of city recorders and asked for all of their council rules. I heard back from 18 different cities, and um, what I decided to do was one of my counterparts in the city of Tualatin, she emailed me back and said, you know, we used the League of Oregon Cities Council Rules um, model, and we just did ours last year. It was a lot of work, but it was a good guideline to follow. And as I started pulling up the council rule best practices from the league and looking at Tualatin's I thought they really it it's a great outline to follow and I like Tualatin's because I it's a real world example of the council rules in place and so that's that's why you have all those documents and Keith and I sat down and we worked through everything and tried to stick in where our council rules, um, maybe it, it was missed in Tualatin's and it's special to Staten. We tried to, to just incorporate it all and follow those best practices. So I, we're, we're hoping that you guys take some time to review it. If you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out and email us. Um, and I think the next steps will be once once you've had a chance to review, if you want to have a work session or if you're ready to bring it back um, okay. before the council. So we can answer Lots any of questions. Lots comments at this time. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, I was, I, I did read through, um, all of this actually and I love Tualatin's and um, one of the things that I saw that was kind of uh, suggested in the agendas area was that it should be um, only no less than three days it should be uh, distributed to the council no less than three days uh, for me I feel like that's just not enough time for 162 pages uh, to read um, I have a full-time job and uh, there's a volunteer position and I love doing it, but I need more time to digest everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. so would, would, would five days be more reasonable for you guys or is that too much to burden staff with? Because I was actually thinking the same thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the challenge become trying to have the time to get through and get the agendas put together. Five days you're looking at it would be out by Wednesday. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean the, the challenges can become doing that. I mean I think it's definitely something we can we can look towards. Um, you know, four days. I think Thursday's normally about the, the soonest for something in advance that you can see. But if five days is what we need to do. I mean obviously staff can work to try to make that happen if that becomes becomes more important. I would say it'd be by the end of that fifth day, so by Wednesday by five, that it should be out would be what the goal would be. Mm -hmm. 
then that would be amazing. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, yes. I, I just want to make sure I'm not alone in this with, pay, with Councilor Hook. Uh, is anyone else interested in getting this a little bit earlier so they have more time to review it or? Okay. I, I don't know that it's the, the delivery of the packet. I think it's the content of the packet. So say we had things out and there were just a couple things we could get done and right. I think if we could figure out a way to early review portions of it or something. Yeah, or some or even when we're setting the agenda, if we could figure out a way to say, oh, this is the potential to be all night based on what it is. So I think we need to c condense it a little bit more. I think so, and some of the some of the long meetings. I don't know. That's just my thought. It's not about but there's, I mean, what you did here is, I agree, I agree with you. I read the, most of it too, and it's like, wow, there's a lot of thorough stuff here. You did a really thorough job. So it's going to yeah. take us a while to digest this and really piece it together and say, yeah, this fits, or maybe tweak this. So it was great to have the information. Like, so appreciative. I appreciated the notes on the side too, kind of where things were coming from. I found that especially helpful. So thank you yeah. for including that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the recess part. <laughs> <laughs> Very well done. The recess part. <laughs> All right. Anything else on that? Okay, so let's move along. There are no staff or commission reports tonight. Any comments from the public? Another another chance to share with us. Feeling brave? Anything? Business from the city manager. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a reminder that next Monday, the 22nd at April 22nd at 6 p.m. at the library, um, there is a town hall the city is co-hosting with the Main Street Group, and Sherry Stewart will be here to give a presentation, so everyone's welcome to attend. And I wanted to give Jana a chance to talk about the library book sale as well. Okay. Um, I um, last week was the library, the Friends of the Library um, spring sale. They had the best sale they've ever had. So I want to thank the community and you guys too, who came out and supported the Friends. During their sale, they made um, more than five thousand sure. dollars, which is pretty incredible. That's amazing. So, yeah. Thank you, and thank you to them for all their hard work. And, and if I may, I'd like to remind the council and members of the audience that this Thursday night at the library at 6.30 is our open house on the economic development strategies. And with that, Mr. Mayor, I have nothing else. Economic development strategy. That's Thursday night? Thursday night at the in the library meeting room. Six six thirty, you said? Oh. I believe so. Okay. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Can we confirm that our um no, no. Um, am I looking at the wrong one? So our budget right. meeting on May sixth is at six PM, not our normal seven PM. Right, it's at six PM. It's okay. a special call. Um, okay. And the first budget meeting will just be oh, passing budget, out the budget, budget so. Yeah. Okay. I just okay. don't want to make sure that yeah. six, six, they six, don't six. come an hour late. Okay. All right. Um, I don't have anything else this evening. Uh, future business from the council. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I'm going to put Emily on the spot for a minute. Emily, can you tell us uh, about uh, cleaning the canal yesterday, I think it was? Was it Sunday? Saturday. 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 Yeah, can you come tell us? I just wanted you to give us an update on how you guys, how successful you there and All what right. role. So RDS hosted a downtown waterway cleanup on Saturday. Um, kind of impromptu, we just all realized that the water was pretty low and there was quite a bit of trash. So we figured we can gather a few people up on Facebook mm -hmm. and, you know, pick up some trash. Um, we ended up getting a couple of extra volunteers, uh, high school students needing um, some hours mm -hmm. and gathered did you count how many bags of trash? There was at least five. There was at least five bags of trash, and um, a couple of very adventurous people actually got into the waterway and got, you know, mm -hmm. a couple of the big pieces out. Okay. So, you know. All right. Where did you guys go from start to um, end? It was pretty much the RDS area, so we went from first to third water okay. to Washington. Okay. And all, um, or how many people were there? Yeah, ten of us took about hour and a half. Okay. What was the oddest thing you found? 
oddest thing we found. Let's see. Um, a couple of tins of cookies that looked like they were several years old. Um, advertisement for a one of the bazaars from uh, uh, the holiday times. Okay. That was in there. Nice. But yeah. All right. Well, good job. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Emily. Uh, let's see. Anything else from the council? Future agenda items, May 6th, budget committee meeting. I think that's been mentioned at 6 p.m. And if there's nothing else, it's 20 minutes to 9. Let's go home.